Well, hello and welcome to uh, chapter four. We're gonna be talking about establishing the need for mechanical ventilation in this lecture. So some of the big things are to take home. Uh, we'll talk about the learning objectives here, but we want to make sure that you sort of see when mechanical ventilation is indicated, and then we'll start talking about alternatives to mechanical ventilation. Uh, and recognizing signs and symptoms is gonna be pretty pretty valuable, especially at the bedside, to sort of see early on signs of hypoxemia, signs of hypercarbia, signs of respiratory fatigue or failure. Uh, so we can get these patients treated uh, sooner on, so that way we can make sure that they have effective support that they need uh, before things become too serious. So the ability to recognize that a patient requires an artificial airway and mechanical ventilation is a skill. Uh, an, an essential skill for all clinicians. Although ventilators have been used for more than half of a century, little evidence and few precise criteria are available to really guide us when to initiate support. So usually it's gonna be a combination of things. We're going to sort of see uh, different situations where we're gonna use different criteria depending on the patient condition, depending on the presentation that we're currently going to see. So there is some gray area in here. However, we'll try to take some of that out uh, for you. But remember, originally mechanical ventilation was instituted because of respiratory failure uh, and it's a, a derangement of uh, abnormal gas exchange in the lungs. And so if gas exchange is abnormal, then we need to help correct and support it. And that's where mechanical ventilations really need to be there. So traditionally, we relied a lot on arterial blood gas management to identify if respiratory failure was present, which would be your P, uh, arterial CO2 level, right? And so we're gonna get a PACO2. Uh, and the idea there is to see, okay, if their CO2 levels are increasing, that's a sign they're in respiratory failure and they need support. But obviously there are other measurements as well for like respiratory muscle strength, especially in your neuromuscular patient population, uh, that can really help us to make a decision when or if to initiate uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, a lot of threshold measurements really reflect a lot of stuff that we can do, not only for initiation, mechanical ventilation, but also for the third part of mechanical ventilation would, would be uh, liberating, right? Getting people off of mechanical ventilation or weaning criteria as well. So if we worried about a neuromuscular patient having a strong enough uh, maximum inspiratory pressure. <sighs> right? How strong is their diaphragm? Well, that's one thing we could say, hey, if it below, falls below a certain level, we should institute mechanical ventilation. But on the other hand of that, if their NIF on the ventilator is above a certain level, their diaphragm shows that it's strong enough now, then that could be a sign that we can liberate them from mechanical ventilation. Traditionally, there's about three phases of mechanical ventilation. There's the initiation, which is what we'll be talking about primarily here. Stabilization, so stabilizing the patient, letting them go through recovery on mechanical ventilation. And your third part would be liberation, getting them off of the ventilator. So we can see some of these criteria will be coming in handy uh, when we start talking about weaning to extubate these patients and get them off the ventilator. So the big thing here, decisions in the acute care setting must be supported by evidence-based criteria, right? We need evidence-based criteria. If you are on a ventilator or about to be on a ventilator, you want the most recent evidence guiding your care because that evidence demonstrates that a particular intervention is beneficial and effective, right? And it improves quality of life or it improves, uh, reduce the length of stay or it lowers the mortality rate of that scenario that you're in. So you want evidence-based criteria. So we're going to try to help you recognize signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, respiratory failure, uh, and then we're going to try to sort of see which areas are we're going to need uh, invasive ventilation. Uh, we will talk about non-invasive in a different lecture, which is part of this chapter as well, but that is an al alternative to invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, so when we're going to do this, we're going to look at just establishing the need uh, for mechanical ventilation in this lecture. So objectives for this first lecture is to differentiate between acute respiratory failure 
and respiratory insufficiency. So when it's acute versus insufficient. And then we're gonna look at three different categories of disorders that may lead to insufficient or acute respiratory failure. Uh, the other thing here is we're gonna look at normal values for our measurements. Not only we talked about these for invasive mechanical ventilation, but also for when we're looking to extubate, when we're looking to wean as well. But the context for this lecture is going to be initiating, right? So we're gonna look at normal values for vital capacity, maximum inspiratory pressure, or negative inspiratory force is another thing that they'll call that. Maximum expiratory pressure. So right now we're seeing strength of muscles with all of those that we just talked about. Force expiratory volume in one second, how fast someone can exhale in one second. Peak expiratory flow, right? Once again, we're looking at obstructive disease with FEV1 and peak flow. Uh, physiologic dead space to tidal volume ratio, or VDVT, as you see here uh, in the lecture. So this is that VDVT ratio. Uh, and then A to A gradient. So P big AO2, so what's inside the alveoli? So P big AO2 versus what's in the artery? P little AO2, right? And we're looking at diffusion here, right? That's the big difference there is diffusion. So the A to A gradient or A to A ratio or the PF ratio even, we'll look at diffusion of gas into the lung. So that's something that we're going to pay attention to. Is their diffusion getting worse? Is their diffusion trending better? If their diffusion's getting worse, that might mean we have atelectasis. That might mean we have thickening of the AC membrane with pus, with inflammatory mediators. Things like that could be going on where this patient might need to be trending towards invasive uh, mechanical ventilation or ventilatory support. All right, first one here. Uh, big thing in the acute care settings, decision must be supported by evidence-based criteria. Once again, the evidence-based criteria demonstrates that a particular intervention, like intubating when their vital capacity is less than 10 ml per kilo, right? So anything like that shows that a particular intervention is beneficial. It shows that they need it, right? It shows that it's been associated with effective outcomes like improved quality of life or reduced length of stay or decreased mortality rate. These are all good things and you want evidence-based criteria to decide this. You don't want different doctors, different clinicians making all different decisions based upon just their opinion. You want it based upon evidence-based medicine and that's going to make sure that we give the highest quality of care to all of our patients no matter who's on that day, who's working that day. So we want to make sure they're evidence-based decisions. So these are things that I want you to start recognizing when you see these. Hey, evidence currently says intubation or mechanical ventilation or non-invasive. You know, these are all effective and beneficial for this patient situation that we're currently facing. Right. So recognizing these signs of distress is going to be beneficial to everyone in the care team. Uh, the, the, to identify the need for an artificial airway is a big, big step, uh, especially early on in patients that may be going under respiratory uh, distress and eventually respiratory fatigue and re eventually respiratory failure. So if we see they're in distress, early intervention depending on the situation, could determine the need and help avoid extra diaphragmatic fatigue that could then lead to longer length of stay on the ventilator or longer ICU stay, so on and so forth. So that's where we're going to have to look at this. Uh, improve quality of life, reduce length of stay, lower mortality. Those are all things that are, are going to be a goal of ours by following evidence-based medicine. So evidence-based medicine is gonna be our big thing that we'll be following with that makes our decisions as a care team. So we're gonna start off with acute respiratory failure or ARF. So acute respiratory failure uh, is something that needs to be addressed right away. The primary purpose of mechanical ventilation is to maintain homeostasis, right? Me mechanical ventilation is indicated when a person cannot achieve an appropriate level of ventilation to maintain adequate gas exchange or an adequate acid base balance. Because if you can't maintain adequate gas exchange, what happens to your pH? What happens to your acid base balance? It gets thrown off. So when we're looking at clinical objectives for mechanical ventilation, if 
someone's left untreated, acute respiratory failure can lead to a coma, right? They're going to get the CO2 coma that eventually, especially with the CO2 of greater than 300, leads to a coma or an anesthetic state, like they're under general anesthesia. Uh, and then that could eventually lead to death, right? They get up so much CO2 built up in their system that their pH gets very acidic and their organs shut down and leads to death, right? So early recognition of impending failure can significantly improve the outcome for these patients. So a number of simple direct observations that we'll talk about here can be used to identify impending respiratory failure and guide us in the appropriate therapeutic strategy, whether that's a non-invasive means or an invasive means. So the big thing here is gonna be the initial assessment of the patient in distress is gonna focus on physiological findings. So things that can be recorded, things that can be observed. So first we need to determine what's their level of consciousness. If the patient's non-responsive, then that's a pretty significant situation. Is the patient awake or asleep, right? Are they awake or asleep? If the patient is asleep or unconscious, uh, can the patient be awakened? Uh, if so, what's the extent, how much does it take to get them to wake up? If it takes a good sternal rub for them to wake up, that's a pretty heavy extent, right? The second thing is going to look at the appearance and the texture of the skin. Do the nail beds show signs of cyanosis? Is the patient pale? Is the patient diaphoretic or sweating, right? Those are all signs that there's a lot of physiological distress going on. The third one is going to evaluate the patient's vital signs, right? What's their respiratory rate? What's their heart rate? What's their blood pressure doing? Is their body temperature, are they running a fever or are they hypothermic? And then finally, what's their oxygenation status? Then if they have poor perfusion, how well do I trust their non-invasive oxygenation, right? And that might be where we obtain a blood gas, right? So sudden onset of dyspnea is typically accompanied with the physiological signs of distress. So for example, patients experiencing respiratory distress usually appear very anxious, right? Their forehead is furrowed and the nostrils are flared and actually the flaring nostrils is a sign we see in infants, right? Uh, that's one of your signs of respiratory stress in a neonate. If you look up the Silverman-Anderson index, right? Bonus content here, right? That's that nasal flaring is a sign of respiratory distress that you're born with, right? That you can have as well. So patients in this respiratory distress appearance usually are diaphoretic or flushed, and right, they might sit upright, or if they're seated, they might lean forward on their elbows in that sort of tripoded uh, position, right? And it helps them uh, extend that thoracic cage so that way they can be able to take a deeper breath, right? So patients in respiratory or even cardiac distress might have an ashen, pale, cyanotic, accessory mus muscle use uh, work of breathing that's going on, right? The sternocleidomastoids, uh, the scalenes, the traps, all those muscles that we talked about in a previous lecture, those are all things that you would see as signs of respiratory distress, right? Uh, the intercostal spaces, the supraclavicular notch up here, uh, those are all signs that uh, if you see them retracting in, right, sucking in as the patient is inhaling, right, that's, that's a sign that uh, that's a very active inspiration. The patient's working hard to breathe. They're extending a lot of work to breathe, right? So even if they say, hey, I'm not feeling like I'm breathing really well, they, they might complain of shortness of breath. Uh, that's a, something to take note of. Paradoxical or abdominal movement of the thoracic abdo abdomen could be noted. So if we see their chest wall moving in and their abdomen moving out at the same time, right, that simultaneous movement is a sign that there's a bad sign of respiratory distress. And you'll see some of this in neonate pediatrics and adults, right? So recognizing this will help you in all different aspects of the practice, right? Uh, so abdominal paradoxical movement, uh, obviously tachycardia. If they start throwing arrhythmias, and one of the big arrhythmias that we start to see with hypoxemia is premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. That's one of your first signs of hypoxemia. So that's one, something to pay attention to. Are they throwing more PVCs? That could be a sign of hypoxemia. Uh, tachycardia, especially if you're, you're hypoxemic, your heart's going to beat faster in an adult patient population because it's trying to get more oxygen to deliver to the tissues because it doesn't have much oxygen to begin with so it beats faster as a result 
uh, hypotension uh, uh, can also be a common finding, right? If, especially if they go into that respiratory fatigue or failure. Uh, pulse oximetry is a very quick and cost-effective method for looking at oxygen saturation and heart rate. As long as it's picking up an accurate heart rate, uh, we can look at the patient's oxygenation status. Uh, and that's something at the bedside, we're not gonna know if the patient's anemic, right? We're not gonna know uh, if they have a reduced cardiac output. Uh, so that's something that if those are low, uh, the oxygen delivery to the tissues is gonna be very poor. And that's where your capillary uh, arterial oxygen content, your C little AO2, uh, is gonna be a helpful calculation as well. Cause it not only includes saturation of oxygen on the hemoglobin, but also how much oxygen is carried in your blood plasma. And we combine those together for the CaO2 equation. So then we can sort of see how much oxygen is actually getting to the tissue. And then if you put cardiac output in there, right? That's going to be your DO2 equation. And it's going to see how much oxygen overall is being delivered to your tissues, which includes your myocardium, which includes your brain, right? That includes all your vital organs that need a lot of oxygen to function. So uh, pu reduced pulse pressures at the bedside can be a helpful assessment as well, because that means our stroke volume might be narrowing. That means we might not be having a good squeeze by the heart, right? And we might have reduced blood flow to the pulse oximeter, which means how reliable is that pulse oximeter for really accurately estimating their actual oxygen saturation and their heart rate. So one of the key things you could do at the bedside when you're looking at something like pulse oximetry is compare the pulse pulse oximetry heart rate to the EKG, uh, whether it's a three lead or 12 lead, whatever's going on at the same time, uh, compare the pulse ox heart rate to an auscultated heart rate, compare the pulse ox heart rate to a palpated pulse, compare it to an EKG heart rate, which would be the most accurate one. If you, there's a disparity in between the heart rates that you're counting and then what's on the heart rate of the pulse oximeter, that's a sign your pulse oximeter may not be picking up a good enough signal to not only give you an accurate heart rate, but also to give you an accurate pulse oximetry evaluation. All right, so with mechanical ventilation, what are our objectives, right? So alveolar uh, ventilation, right, is to achieve normal or eucapnic ventilation, right? Uh, uh, or in some cases where the lungs are very sick, there's a strategy called permissive hypercapnia or permissive hypercapnia uh, is required in patients usually with life-threatening conditions like life-threatening asthma exacerbation, acute lung injury or ARDS, patients to avoid high ventilation volumes or to avoid high pressures to let that lung tissue avoid extra trauma. So we want to support or manipulate pulmonary gas exchange to allow for normal ventilation. However, in extreme cases, we may actually let the patient's CO2 level build up. We may let them be, become acidic, not to the point where it's life-threatening, but to a point where we're allowing that tissue to heal and avoiding excessive pressures, avoiding ventilator-induced lung injury. So we see this with asthma, like I said, life-threatening asthma, exacerbations, acute lung injury, ARDS patients, uh, patients that we just need to let the lung tissue recover as much as possible. So um, supporting or manipulating gas exchange can be to a normal level for that patient's baseline as well. We're gonna see in patients that are chronic CO2 retention patients that we're going to hold their CO2 level, their baseline CO2 level as the target CO2 level for mechanical ventilation. Instead of getting a CO2 perfectly a 40 for someone that retains a normal baseline CO2 of 50, doesn't make sense, right? Their baseline is 50. And so uh, uh, unless the extenuating circumstances happen, we're gonna try to target more close to their baseline physiological status, especially in your COPD patient population that is hypercarbic to begin with. And same thing uh, here, we're got, we gotta know those baselines. So when it comes time to wean and extubate, understand that their baseline CO2 levels are higher is gonna help us make decisions that are more appropriate or most appropriate for that patient. Uh, alveolar oxygenation uh, is something else to look at here when we're looking at a goal of mechanical ventilation. Uh, alveolar oxygenation maintains adequate oxygen delivery to the tissues as long as there's good diffusion. 
right? As long as there's good diffusion, we don't have an inflamed alveolar capillary membrane, nothing like that's going on. We want to maintain adequate oxygen delivery. So this is your, your CaO2 uh, or your CaO2, uh, your capillary content of oxygen equation. So your C little AO2 involves how much hemoglobin you have, uh, how much uh, of that hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. And then you're gonna add that to what's in the plasma, how much is in your plasma. So that's your P little AO2. And you're going to combine those together and that's how much oxygen getting into your plasma. Traditionally, if you have good diffusion, how much pressure of oxygen there is in your alveoli should reach equilibrium with how much pressure there is in the pulmonary capillary, right? But we know, and especially in our really sick patients, that diffusion decreases, and so we're going to have a harder time getting it in there. Well, the other part of the, the, we can get oxygen in there, but that's great. What if our heart's not pumping that oxygen to the rest of the body? Right, and that's where cardiovascular status is going to be part of your patient assessment with mechanical ventilation. If I can get oxygen into the bloodstream, great, but if I can't deliver it to the brain, if I can't get it delivered to the kidneys, if I can't get it delivered to the myocardium, what's the point, right? So we need to make sure cardiovascular status is an essential part of mechanical ventilation. Right, It's not just a machine that pushes air in and lets it out. We also need to make sure that whatever we're getting in there is being distributed appropriately. So alveolar oxygenation, looking at things like your CO2, looking at things like your cardiac output are going to be pretty important. Uh, other things that we're going to be looking at are going to be increasing things like lung volume, right? If we have a patient with severe atelectasis that's decreasing surface area, that's in those areas of atelectasis, the capillaries that are around the atelectatic areas, the alveoli, those capillaries, when they have a low P big AO2 in the alveoli, those capillaries will vaso constrict. This is called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, something you can look up on the side and we can talk about in a separate letter, lecture, hopefully. But with those that vasoconstriction, it back pressures that the blood going through the lungs to an area that is open. So that's actually a protection mechanism against a shunt. But if we have too much atelectasis, our surface area to diffuse CO2 and O2 decreases significantly and what's going to happen with that patient overall? Their saturations are going to be poor, they're going to have high oxygen requirements, and their CO2s are going to build up. So things like atelectasis, even though we are okay with a little bit of atelectasis sometimes, can also, uh, when it gets to an extent, actually be a hindrance to our patient situation. So we want to prevent or treat atelectasis with adequate end inspiratory lung inflation, right? Make sure they have an adequate volume for breath delivery. Like I said, in patients that are super sick, this goes into your ARDS type patients, we may use very, very tiny tidal ones, tidal ones that are around four mLs per kilo down the road, and we're okay with some atelectasis because it's allowing some of those atelectatic areas, those lung units, to heal, right, by not being used. So sometimes atelectasis can be a good thing, but in an extreme case, it can cause a lot of shearing trauma or volume trauma or atelect trauma where as the alveoli inflate, they rip open, right, and you're causing that shearing trauma. So we need to make sure we have adequate pressures with mechanical ventilation to help restore or maintain an adequate functional residual capacity, an adequate FRC, an adequate end lung volume. When you exhale, you don't exhale 100% of your breath. You exhale your tidal volume. The rest of it is FRC. So we need to make sure that our patients have an adequate FRC to avoid lung trauma. And the third part here is to reduce work of breathing. And we're going to see this a lot, especially with different, not only cardiovascular situations where they're trying to work to breathe to overcome cardiovascular compromise, but also with pulmonary disease process or Guess what? A combination where someone has both a cardiovascular issue and a pulmonary issue like a pneumonia at the same time, they're going to work hard to breathe. And what the ventilator does is it, it, hey, it essentially takes that workload of breathing off of the lungs. It takes that workload of breathing and extra support for the heart to help beat all that extra oxygen. It takes that workload off of the heart. And you're going to see hemodynamic compromise is actually one of your indications for mechanical ventilation as well. So reduce Reducing work of breathing 
is going to be a big factor when we see this. If we extubate a patient and they're working really hard to breathe, that could be something where we either consider going to non-invasive ventilation, an alternative, or going back to invasive ventilation. Because working hard to breathe uh, is not maintainable for a prolonged period of time because the muscles that we're using, skeletal, and those muscles can fatigue fairly easily. Uh, the next part are your, going to be your clinical objectives, right? So something I want to mention here before we go into a lot of these clinical objectives for mechanical ventilation is signs of respiratory distress uh, can be also a result of someone experiencing extreme emotional states like a panic attack, right? If I'm panicking because I got to take one of Derek's exams, right? That's going to be something big. And what? how am I going to breathe, right? How am I going to look when someone's in a panic attack? Do they look like they're breathing very easily or do they look like they're working a little hard to breathe there, right? You're probably saying, hey, uh, respiratory distress, emotional distress really can be something that we need to pay attention to, uh, especially for like an emergency medicine or critical care medicine. Is this an emotional distress? Does that mean that that distress is not real? No, it just means that that's something to pay attention to. Uh, so usually uh, both verbal and nonverbal communication are pretty viable. Uh, vital to when you're assessing this patient. Well, is this a situation where the person might need a medication to help with their emotional distress? Right, that's something to discuss with the care team, right? Uh, so maybe it's something as simple as that that helps them calm down, that helps them slow their breathing down to a point where then now it's an adequate uh, respiratory breathing pattern and it's not something that, that's showing signs of distress. Uh, the primary purpose, once again, of ventilation is to maintain adequate homeostasis. So if they can't achieve an appropriate level of ventilation to maintain gas exchange or an acid-base balance, then we're going to have to look at mechanical ventilation. So reversing acute respiratory failure is going to be one of our big signs. Uh, that's going to be determined traditionally by PaCO2 or an AVG where we look at the arterial oxygen CO2 level. And that's something that we'll look at there. Reverse respiratory distress, right? They're in a lot of respiratory distress that has not um, uh, has not responded to previous therapy. To reverse hypoxemia, especially if they're throwing PVCs or if they're having runs of VTAC, right? That's a good sign that they could be having hypoxemia, right? Low oxygen delivery to that myocardium. You're going to start to see those rhythms that are not so friendly to life. Uh, prevent or uh, reverse atelect atelectasis, maintain the FRC. We talked about that before. Uh, if we have atelectasis and every time we, do, we deliver breath, it rips open those alveoli. It could be called shearing trauma or atelect trauma, right? That, that initial surface tension overcoming that critical, critical opening pressure is not enough to maintain that. And that can cause inflammation, that can cause stress on those areas of atelectasis that they keep opening up keep being ripped open and that could cause uh, inflammatory mediators that can cause edema that can cause a lot of bad things to develop there so we might have to do things like increase mean airway pressure uh, to help with that and we'll talk about different ways to do that in a different lecture to reduce uh, respiratory muscle or reverse respiratory muscle fatigue for sure. If we see that a patient's drive starts slowing down or they're breathing rapid and shallow and they, they, they have hypercapnia, then that's a sign that they're in respiratory fatigue or failure and we need to let those muscles recover. So if you run a marathon, do you want to run a marathon the next day? No, you need those muscles to recover. And essentially those patients are running a marathon. They're running a respiratory marathon and we need to let those muscles recover from that fatigue. And so when we select modes of ventilation, that's something that we need to be careful of. Is it, are they on a mode of mechanical ventilation that allows for recovery, that allows for the work of breathing to be very, very minimal so the muscles are recovering? All right, we'll talk about that. Uh, permit sedation, paralysis, or both. So one of your indications for mechanical ventilation is, hey, guess what, general anesthesia, right? So that's where we look at sedation or paralysis, especially if we're gonna paralyze someone for a surgery because you don't want them moving around. Uh, let's say it's a heart open heart surgery. Do you want the patient moving around doing an open heart surgery? 
Probably not, right? Uh, so paralysis and sedation would be appropriate because if you're paralyzed for heart surgery, you probably want sedation on board. So uh, those are all things uh, that are a good sign for uh, a good objective, a clinical objective for situations such as that. Um, when we're looking at reducing myocardial oxygen consumption, like I was talking about earlier, if someone's in heart failure, if, they're, if their squeeze is very weak, on their heart. They're having a very hard time hemodynamically. One of the things we can do to take the workload off of the heart is breathe and get adequate oxygen delivery to the myocardium. That's going to take that workload off there. Not only that, but if we're using positive pressure ventilation, what happens to the vena cava, right? Does the vena cava get smaller with positive thoracic pressure or does it get bigger with positive thoracic pressure? Well, with positive thoracic pressure, the vena cava gets smaller. Right? And so what we're seeing here is then preload. Then the amount of blood that goes into the heart, the amount of workload on the ventricles decreases. So that can help in certain situations, not to the extreme, but that can help in certain situations. Positive pressure could reduce myocardial oxygen consumption and therefore help that heart sort of recover. Right, uh, And then obviously minimize associated complications and reduce mortality, especially of different issues with head traumas, things like that. So we're going to have a lot of good objectives that happen with mechanical ventilation. So uh, signs of respiratory distress, we've already talked about that. This is where we're going to get into some more details here, right? The, what's their level of consciousness? Is the patient awake? Uh, can they respond to questions, right? Uh, how much does it take to wake the patient up? Is it a sternal rub or is it just a simple touch of their hand, right? This is where you look at things like the Glasgow Coma Scale, right? Uh, that's one of the classic things. If their GCS is less than eight, that's a, a sign of the inability to have proper function uh, of different things like that. So you're going to see different criteria that includes neurological uh, criteria. So is the patient, once again, is the patient awake or asleep, right? If the patient's asleep or unconscious, can they be wakened up? And what extent does it take? Is it a sternal rub? Is it just touching their nail beds, right? Is it pain or is it just a simple verbal response, right? Hey, how are you doing in there? And then they wake up and stare at you with a grumpy look, right? So what extent does it take to wake that patient up? Second, what's their appearance and the texture of the skin, right? We've already gone through this. Uh, their nail beds, do their lips or gums show evidence of cyanosis? Is the patient pale and diaphoretic? Uh, what are their vital signs? What's their heart rate? What's their blood pressure? What's their body temperature? What's their pulse oximetry status? What's their non-invasive status? And do I trust the pulse oximeter, especially if those digits are looking pale or they have poor capillary refill, right? If I have someone has a cap refill five seconds and a normal is two seconds or less, then that's a sign I may not be as trust, uh, likely to trust that pulse oximeter as I would in arterial blood gas. Right, other things, uh, sudden onset of dyspnea is typically uh, accompanied by physical signs of distress. So uh, if they're anxious or they're furrowed, right, we talked about that physical appearance. Are they tripoding? Are they sitting up? Are they trying to stent open their thoracic cage? Do we see retractions? Do we see accessory muscle uses? Do we see paradoxical breathing? Those are all things that we need to evaluate uh, when we're looking at these patients as well. So start to put these pictures together. Start to think about what are some signs of respiratory distress, because these are going to be a key aspect to determine whether a patient needs arterial blood gas management, to determine if we need to move closer and more towards invasive mechanical ventilation. So when we're looking at acute respiratory failure, Respiratory activity is either absent or it's insufficient to maintain adequate oxygen or carbon dioxide clearance. In other words, if we can't get oxygen into the bloodstream very effectively or we can't get CO2 out of the bloodstream effective, uh, despite whatever initial therapy we're using, let's say it's just nasal oxygen or let's say it's high velocity nasal therapy or even high flow therapy, right? If we're still having trouble getting carbon dioxide clearance, our CO2s are still up there higher than they should be for that patient, or our oxygenation's lower than where it should be for that patient, uh, that's a clinically an acute respiratory failure may be defined as the, the inability to maintain PaO2, PaCO2, and pH at acceptable levels. So what I'm hearing myself say here 
is those three are going to be your uh, your primary indicators of acute respiratory failure, right? So P little a CO2, so arterial PO2, arterial CO2, and then arterial pH, right? And that's what we're looking at for maintaining acceptable acceptability levels. If they're not acceptable levels, and let's say they're on non-invasive ventilation with uh, uh, or a mask, then we we're looking at that patient possibly needing invasive ventilation. So generally, it's considered in uh, patients who demonstrate a PAO2 below the normal range for their age under the ambient atmospheric conditions. So remember, there is an equation for this, of course. There's an equation for almost everything, but equations represent physiology. You're like, I'm tired of equations. I don't see anyone doing them. But here's the advantage of knowing the equations. They tell you about physiology. They represent physiology. So if you know what goes into the equation, you know what goes into the physiology behind it. So if you take someone's age in years divided by four plus four, so let's say they're um, 100, right? So if you take their age in years, divided by four, and then you add four, right? That tells you their normal A to A gradient. P big AO2 minus P little AO2, right? And so that's their normal, right? That's their normal. So as you get older, you have disquamatization of your respiratory zone, which means you're losing a little bit of surface area the older you get, which means your diffusion, if you're losing surface area in your lungs, your diffusion also decreases as you get older. And so that's why it decreases as you get older. So that's where we look under, hey, what's the uh, PO2 level for is it normal for a per person at this age or under ambient atmosphere conditions? If we're practicing at sea level versus we're practicing at high altitude, that's going to be different P little AO2s, right? In Colorado, we're looking at PO2s in the 70s being okay at sea level, 80 to 100 is normal, right? So we got to look at where we're at under atmospheric conditions. The second thing is PaCO2, right? A PaCO2 greater than 50 millimeters of mercury and rising is one of those indications that we'll have to look at. Now we're talking about non-CO2 retaining patients here. So PO2 greater than 50 and rising is a sign. Uh, a pH 7.25 and or lower, uh, if it's falling below 7.25, uh, that's a sign that they might need invasive ventilation. Even if they're in non-invasive, that's a sign they might need that as well. So there are two forms uh, of acute respiratory failure that have been described. Uh, one is hypoxic respiratory failure, and the other one's hypercapnic failure, and we'll go into those next. But I do need you to know these values, uh, and we're talking about normal physiology, we're not talking about a CO2 retainer here, that that PO2 is lower than what it should be for that patient's range or uh, condition, right? Uh, or a CO2 greater than 50 millimeters of mercury and rising or pH 725 and or lower are very, very good definitions or very good way to show respiratory failure. All right, the two forms, I did preview them just a second ago. The two forms are going to be hypoxic respiratory failure. Uh, this one's going to be a failure to oxygenate, right? That, by definition, failure to oxygenate. So this can be an acute life-threatening thing for sure, uh, because what happens if you don't have adequate oxygen delivered to your brain, right? You get a hypoxic brain injury. What happens if you don't have adequate supply to your heart? Your heart muscle starts throwing abnormal rhythms and eventually cramps and goes into a failure, right? A heart attack, right? Uh, the bad things happen when you don't get oxygen delivery to your organs. What happens if there's no oxygen or, uh, delivery to your kidneys? Well, your kidneys start shutting down. Well, those are filters. Those are very important. What happens with oxygen delivery to your liver? What happens with oxygen delivery? So on and so forth. So what we're going to see with hypoxemic respiratory failure, our organ compromise is going to be a big part of that. So uh, it's vital that we get good oxygen delivery to the tissues, right? So tissue hypoxia is going to be one of our primary concerns here. We could even see this with the left shift of the oxyhemoglobin curve, right? If we have someone with carbon monoxide poisoning. Their saturation of oxygen in their bloodstream is going to be great. It's going to hold on to that hemoglobin. The oxygen and hemoglobin, they're in love with each other. But what happens to the oxygen when it goes by the myocardium? Is it going to give away that oxygen to the myocardium? 
No. So what happens is we're going to have tissue hypoxia. The heart muscle is going to be hypoxic. It's not going to have the oxygen it needs, and therefore that muscle can lead into fatigue and failure, right? Because it doesn't have the oxygen it needs to keep going. So hypoxemic failure, even if their SATs are good and they have a condition like they're left shifted, can even lead to a failure of that organ system. So we'll see that carbon monoxide poisoning, they'll usually go into multi-organ system failure. Their kidneys will be failing, their heart's going to be failing, they're going to have altered mental status because they're not getting good oxygen delivery to their brain. And even though their non-invasive saturation looks great, they actually have tissue hypoxia, right? So hypoxemic respiratory failure is a very serious issue. And then we got to look at, okay, what are some of our treatments? Mechanical ventilation is going to be one of those because remember with mechanical ventilation, we're using the alveolar air equation. We're using, hey, what are three ways to get oxygen to a patient's bloodstream? Well, in the alveolar air equation, I have FI of two. I have an increase in barometric pressure, or I can get rid of CO2. Well, a ventilator can do all three of those things. It can get rid of CO2, it can increase pressure, and it can increase FiO2. So when we're looking at hypoxemic respiratory failure, that's what we're going to look at. How can I get more oxygen into this patient's bloodstream? Is it by increasing FiO2? Hey, if they're not breathing, this getting rid of CO2 is going to be the big thing. Getting the CO2 evacuated from their system, so that way there's more parking spaces for oxygen in their hemoglobin. Yeah, let's do that, right? And then if that's not working, I can increase FiO2. If the FiO2 is not working, right? Their FiO2s are above 60% and their their PO2s are still below 60 millimeters of mercury, then I probably should go up on pressure, right? Because I might have some atelectasis. I might, they're refractory to FiO2, so I might need to go up on pressure. So then when we look at hypoxemic respiratory failure, we got to figure out, is it hypercarbia that's causing it? Is it diffusion that's causing it? Right? Is there a lot of atelectasis that's there that we can help correct with positive pressure ventilation? Hypercapnic respiratory failure is the second one here, uh, also known as acute ventilatory failure. In other words, your CO2 levels traditionally here are the ones that are super high. So the person cannot uh, achieve an adequate or maintain an adequate or normal CO2 level. So we're looking at a person that's going into respiratory fatigue or failure. So their saturations are going to be fine. Their oxygen delivery is going to be okay. But now their CO2 levels are starting to climb up, right? This is a person, let's say it's a neuromuscular patient, right? That's just uh, Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis that affects the lungs. Most of them don't, but some could. Uh, and we have that patient where they, they're breathing more shallow and more shallow, or more shallow. But let's say we're giving them lots of nasal oxygen. Well, that's great that you're giving them nasal oxygen. However, their CO2 levels are still gonna start to climb because what's their ability to move gas, right? So let's start talking about the first one, which is hypoxemic respiratory failure, right? This is a, a result of a VQ mismatch or ventilation to perfusion, perfusion mismatch, right? So we're looking primarily at diffusion of gas issues, right? Diffusion of gas issues. So anything that inflames the AC membrane or makes the AC membrane thicker, like pulmonary edema or swelling, like we see with pneumonia, anything that makes the AC membrane thicker is going to be something that we'll see hypoxemic respiratory failure. So pneumonia, classic case of hypoxemic respiratory failure. If we have a right to left shunt, uh, like we could see with a patent for amino oval, um, anything that's alveolar hypoventilation, in other words, we're not uh, having the adequate match of the VQ. Uh, even something like aging that we talked about earlier, where the older you get, the more your alveoli disquamatize. In other words, the cells slough off and you're gonna have less surface area for diffusing gas into and out of uh, the lungs. So uh, that, those are all things that can happen. In theory, you could also have inadequate inspired oxygen levels, right? If you're in an environment that's hypoxic environment, a space that could easily do that as well. So a good working definition of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure uh, uh, is an acute life-threatening or vital organ-threatening tissue hypoxia. I'll repeat that again, and you can slow it down and rewind it. A good working definition of an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure is an acute life-threatening 
or vital organ threatening. In other words, our organ systems are starting to shut down, decreased level of conscious, uh, BUN and creatinine are going up, LFTs are increasing, all right, so cardiac enzymes, so on and so forth, right? Uh, Life-threatening or vital organ-threatening tissue hypoxia, right? Hypoxemic respiratory failure can be treated with supplemental oxygen. This is usually the first and simplest line of treatment. Hey, if someone's hypoxic, what are we going to give them? Well, let's start with nasal oxygen. So we're going to start with that nasal oxygen. Or if that's not working, right, especially if they're refractory to FiO2, which means uh, we have an FiO2 of greater than 60% with a PO2 less than 60 millimeters of mercury usually means that we might need pressure, right? That's the 60-60 rule. So we might need to put some CPAP, some continuous positive airway pressure to stent open to allow for expansion of lungs to help with diffusion pressure, pushing pressure across the AC membrane. All right, and uh, finally, we might need mechanical ventilation if hypoxemic respiratory failure occurs along with hypercapnic respiratory failure. In other words, do they get to the point where their CO2 levels start increasing and they're working hard to breathe? That's a sign we might need to add mechanical ventilation. So can you have hypoxemic and hypercarbic respiratory failure simultaneous? Absolutely, right? If I'm hypoxemic, I'm gonna not get a lot of oxygen to my tissues. My tissues are gonna produce a lot of CO2 or carbonic acid because they're producing acid, they're, they're hypoxic, right? So I'm producing a lot of CO2, but I'm not able to breathe that out. I'm working hard to breathe. So now I have both uh, hypoxemic and hypercarbic respiratory failure. Uh, hypercapnic or hypercarbic respiratory failure uh, uh, is usually occurs when a person can't achieve uh, adequate ventilation or maintain their normal CO2, like what I was talking about COPD here is, if they can't attain their normal CO2 of 50, if they can't attain uh, their normal CO2, then what happens is your ventilatory pump, your ability to breathe gas in and out, Usually your respiratory muscles, your thoracic cage, the nerves controlled by the respiratory center, like what we talk about with spinal cord injuries or neuromuscular patients uh, in some cases, uh, usually those are the ones that fail, right? We're seeing that uh, where you have a spinal cord injury patient that has such a high C-spine fracture that they're dependent on mechanical ventilation. Right, that phrenic nerve is no longer sending signals to the diaphragm, and that's why they need artificial support. So anything that causes ventilatory pump failure is what we're looking at with a cause of hypercarbic or hypercapnic respiratory failure. Uh, so when we're looking at this, uh, disorders that can lead to this are you sure your CNS uh, disorders, like anything with your central nervous system, neuromuscular disorders, as we talked about with like uh, ALS, or um, uh, we talked about Guillain-Barre, myasthenia gravis, any of those neuromuscular disorders, SMA, right? Uh, or even disorders that increase work of breathing. Anything that increases work of breathing can easily cause hypercarbic failure because what happens with your skeletal muscle, the diaphragm, remember, is skeletal muscle, right? What happens with your external Intercostals, what happens with your sternomatoclastoids? What happens with all those accessory muscles? They're all skeletal muscle and they can go into fatigue if we use them too much, right? So anything that increases work of breathing can cause pump failure because we're overworking that pump and eventually it goes into fatigue. So when we're looking at signs of hypoxemia, this is the bedside clinician's signs of hypoxemia. And this is categorized over here as mild to moderate or severe. Uh, severe signs of hypoxemia. You're gonna see some uh, congruency between these two categories. However, one is gonna be lethargic and one's gonna be coma, right? One's gonna be a loss of consciousness. The other one's gonna be, hey, I'm having a lot of bad headaches right now, right? Uh, so we're going to see some differences between the two, so it's important to sort of note how severe is this hypoxemia, especially if this person just shows up or you're just evaluating this patient. You want to see, are we in the mild to moderate stage? Are we in the severe stage? If this person's in a coma, they're not conscious whatsoever. There's no gag reflex. They're, they're, um, they're very, very sleepy. Uh, they have hypotension. They're bradycardic. Then I know this patient might have severe hypoxemia. We not, might need to go ahead and do uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. They might require an artificial airway currently versus a patient that's tachypnic, dyspneic, they, they have a headache, right? They're just feeling a little lethargic. They're feeling a little weak. 
that's going to be that mild to moderate. Hey, let's try your non-invasive methods. Let's try high flow oxygen or high FiO2 uh, therapy and see what happens. So recognizing these signs and symptoms is important to determine how aggressive you're going to be with your therapeutic intervention, right? So very, very similar uh, hypoxemia and hypercarbia uh, closely resemble uh, the signs seen in patients with respiratory distress. So tachycardia, tachypnea are usually early indications of hypoxia. So in some cases of hypoxemic respiratory failure, the patient condition can be treated successfully with just uh, high FIO2s, right? So some hypoxemic conditions, even if we give them high FiO2s, they are refractory to it, right? So some hypoxemic conditions, such as uh, severe shunting, we, like we can see with some heart defects, are refractory to oxygen therapy, or even some pneumonias or severe severe pneumonia, severe ARDS type situations. We're going to have an, uh, patients that are refractory to high FiO2, so we might need to give them more than just higher FiO2s, right? So sometimes giving someone high FIO2s may not significantly reduce the level of hypoxemia, and that's called refractory hypoxemia. If we give them higher FIO2s and their PO2 doesn't really change or, or hardly at all, or if not at all, then that's a sign that they're refractory to FIO2, they're refractory hypoxemic. What about signs of hypercapnia? This is going to be fairly similar, right? We talked about tachypnea, tachycardia. These things are, are very common that you'll see between the two. However, uh, when we're looking at this, you're going to see uh, uh, some differences here with that mild to moderate. How aggressive do we treat these patients depending on if it's severe? Uh, if a patient has a loss of consciousness, if there's convulsions, if there's hallucinations, it's a sign that their hypercarbia is pretty severe and we need to be more aggressive about that intervention. Whether it is non-invasive or invasive ventilation, that's going to be something where we tend to be more aggressive with compared to a patient that is just having headaches, feeling drowsy, uh, has some sweating, and their skin's a little red, things like that going on. So those are going to be something that we're going to be less aggressive on. Maybe we still do non-invasive with that patient, but maybe we look at other causes for the hypercarbia and start treating the underlying causes as well. So important to understand which ones would be more on the severe side and which ones would be on that mild to moderate side because that's going to help us determine our aggressiveness of interventions in most cases. So hypercapnic failure patients, uh, just to go back on that a little bit, uh, their, CO2, their CO2 levels are elevated with hypoxemia uh, traditionally, right? If they're receiving high flow oxygen, you may not see that hypoxemia component to it. But if I have let my CO2 levels go up without supplemental oxygen, I'm going to have a decrease in my saturation. Right? So an elevation of CO2 leads to an increase in cerebral blood flow that results in dilation of my cerebral blood vessels, right? and that's where you'll see some of that headache stuff going on. right? So severe hypercapnia, if left untreated, will lead to what's called CO2 narcosis, right? which means I can see the hallucinations. I'll have cerebral depression. I'll, it'll lead to coma. It'll lead to death. So those are all things I just wanted to harp on that that previously there, that if left untreated, uh, the hypoxemia, hypercapnic, and acidosis can eventually then lead to cardiac dysrhythmia, as we talked about that before. I'm throwing PVCs, and then I have three PVCs in a row. I have a run of VTAC, right? Uh, I can go into VFib, right? Uh, cardiac arrest, right? So all those consequences that we're looking at there really underscores the importance of recognizing that a patient is in an acute or impending respiratory failure, and the need, this needs to help us identify which therapy needs to be done in a timely manner, right? If they just have a mild headache versus they're in a coma, right? It tells us how aggressive to be, how early on, right? So the elements that are needed to achieve a successful, a successful outcome are to use supplemental oxygen therapy, of course, right? Uh, maintain uh, the patient airway. Hopefully they have a patent airway or they're able to maintain a patent airway. Uh, and the other thing is going to be uh, continuous monitoring. So someone's in this type of distress, 
they need to be on continuous monitoring, right? Someone's working hard to breathe. Uh, this isn't a person that you just uh, give them a nebulizer and walk away. So this is going to be a, a situation where you want to make sure that they're on continuous monitoring because they can still trend worse. They can still uh, uh, have a change from that current condition. So you're going to want to put them on continuous monitoring for their oxygenation and ventilatory status. And so that's where we might do things like entitled CO2 nasal cannula or masks that incorporate entitled CO2 to help look at CO2, to help look at perfusion. Remember, that's an advantage of entitled CO2 is it helps us also look at perfusion besides just the breathing, right? Uh, and then obviously pulse oximetry, ABG analysis if needed or when indicated for these patients as well especially if their pulse ox is looking uh, like we're not picking up the most reliable sin, uh, signal, right? If it's there's a discrepancy between that and an auscultated heart rate or that heart rate and an EKG heart rate, that's a sign we might need to go with an invasive um, oxygen uh, assessment. All right, so things that increase uh, uh, the, the inability to breathe uh, the central nervous disorders are going to be one of the first ones here. And of course, top of the list is going to be depressant drugs. So traditionally, the drugs that we're looking at here are anything that depresses the central nervous system. So barbiturates, uh, tranquilizers, narcotics, uh, general anesthetic agents are typically your depressant drugs. Once again, barbiturates, tranquilizers, narcotics, and general anesthetics. These are ones that are going to really inhibit your drive to breathe. And these are the patients, if it's not readily reversible, then we need to look at doing some form of assisted ventilation. But if it is readily reversible, we need to reverse it uh, in a situation um, before we start putting airways and tubes and stuff into patients. Uh, the next one is going to be brain or uh, brainstem lesions like a stroke or a trauma to the head or neck even. Uh, cerebral hemorrhages can easily do this. Tumors, uh, spinal cord injuries, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, can easily uh, decrease that drive or decrease that ability to breathe. And that's where even with some of these uh, tumor patients, we were doing MVV studies in our PFT lab because we were trying to look at their drive to breathe. So things to pay attention there. Uh, so we talked about the stroke, head trauma, cerebral hemorrhage, increased intracranial pressures are all going to be things that we're, we'll have to look at there. Uh, other things, hypothyroidism, uh, sleep apnea syndrome uh, are all things that can easily decrease that drive to breathe. So we're going to be looking at a lot of things that can be really impactful and CNS is not something to overlook, especially when we're looking at things like narcotics or things like tumors or traumas to the head that can really decrease their drive to breathe. That's why some of these patients that have uh, head, neck trauma injuries might need mechanical ventilation, even though they're not in quote unquote respiratory failure or fatigue or hypoxemic or hypercarbic failure, they still might need support with mechanical ventilation because their drive to breathe, their CNS drive is compromised in one way or another. So the CNS disorders that decrease the respiratory drive, such as depression of the respiratory centers by drugs or trauma, can lead to a reduction in minute ventilation, your I to E ratios, your alveolar minute ventilation, uh, and then it'll ultimately can down the road lead to hypercapnia and hypoxemia. So that's the sign that we might have to go ahead and institute it if they're already hypercarbonic, if they're already a hy uh, hypoxemic, right? Uh, in otherwise normal individuals, an increased CO2 greater than 70 millimeters of mercury usually is a CNS depressant. So once your CO2 gets above 70, that's when you start to see that altered CNS status, right? And like I said, uh, if you get up to around 300 millimeters of mercury, that's more of your general anesthesia range, right? So once you get above 70, that's where you're going to see a lot of CNS depression, which reduces your drive to breathe, your ventilation. Uh, you're going to usually at that level have hypoxemia. Like we're talking non-COPDers here, you're going to have hypoxemia that is accompanied with this process. So normally uh, that hypoxemia acts as a respiratory stimulant right through your peripheral chemoreceptors going back to first semester, right? Acts through your peripheral chemoreceptors to increase your brainstem to say, hey, breathe faster. But 
because the CNS is already compromised, your body's not going to respond to that that chemo, the chemoreceptor signal, and your ability to respond to hypoxemia is diminished right in that CNS issue. So other CNS disorders, uh, we talked about stroke, uh, tumors, head trauma, can alter the pattern of breathing. So this is where you'll see your Shane Stokes, you'll see your Biot's breathing patterns, you'll see those alternate patterns. So those are all signs that patient might need support, right? So if I have a cerebral hemorrhage uh, due to a brain injury, or an increased intracranial pressure issue, issue from a trauma, right? If there's a lot of bleeding occurs with, the, with that injury, uh, I can start breathing abnormally like Shane Stokes, right? Where I just rapid, rapid, deeper, deeper, and then shall, shall, and then apneic, right? I can do that Shane Stokes or biots, right? So Shane Stokes or biots on these patients is a sign that they have a cerebral abnormality and it'll affect their reflex responses, their ability to swallow and protect their airway. So this could be a sign they need an invasive airway. So endotracheal intubation might be required to protect their airway from aspiration or obstruction of their tongue even, right? So if I start to see those Shane Stokes situations, if I start to see those stroke victims, um, that are having those issues, then I might need to go ahead and put an invasive airway. So if, let's say I have a stroke victim, uh, breath sounds are diminished, but I hear snoring on inhalation, right? They're snoring, but they're unconscious, they're unresponsive to even to painful stimuli. Uh, what's the most appropriate thing to do here, right? Is this patient protecting their airway? Uh, are they are they able to have an adequate CO2 elimination for their body? Are they able to get a full breath in if they're snoring, right? Their their airway is obstructed, right? What's happening with their cerebral perfusion and their intracranial pressures, right? So when we're looking at this, this person might need an artificial airway. Now, when we talk about ICP pressures, I wanna be clear on this here. Uh, the effect of hyperventilating a, a patient, you might see this out there, the effect of hyperventilating, and your book discusses this as well, will reduce, decrease the CO2, which would then help reduce intracranial pressure. Evidence-based medicine, important point here, evidence-based medicine says that this effect is temporary. That vasoconstrict, the, the, alt, the altering of your ICP, the decreasing of your ICP by hyperventilating, it's a temporary effect uh, and it only lasts about 24 hours. So eventually the body will adapt to that change through renal compensation and so that's why it may not last longer than 24 hours. So you can hyperventilate to help reduce someone's CO2, but for about 24 hours until your kidneys kick in and then say, yeah, no, I'm not gonna allow that, right? So you might see that out there, but the evidence says, hey, after 24 hours, your kidneys kick in and it negates that hyperventilation effect, right? So controlled hyperventilation is still in use um, for to suddenly lower the ICP. Someone comes in with a massive ICP, we might use it right to suddenly lower it, right? Um, but the desire to use this technique for a traumatic brain injury for anything longer than 24 hours uh, is not something that uh, is physiological, uh, physiologically supported. Right. Um, so if we have a, a, a patient that has a sudden increase in their intracranial pressures, uh, the desire to use a hyperventilation to intubate and hyperventilate to decrease that ICP uh, for long term is not appropriate. But for 24 hours, it could be right. Traumatic brain injuries. Uh, uh, usually have a better long-range outcome when con when controlled hyperventilation is not used. Uh, and so that's where the current evidence is. So you can use it in temporary circumstances. However, there's been no evidence to currently support anything longer than that has been used. And in fact, the current evidence says, hey, uh, patients with traumatic brain injuries uh, have a better long-range outcome three to six months out when controlled hyperventilation is not used. So that's what the current evidence uh, says. So that's something to pay attention to in your practice. Neuromuscular conditions are going to be uh, something we have to pay a lot of attention to, especially when we start looking at our, our, our criteria for, for intubation. So criteria, neuromuscular conditions that can lead to respiratory failure are usually a result of a motor nerve damage, problems with transmission of nerve impulses, like what we see with Guillain-Barre or myasthenia gravis, right? 
problems with transmission or spinal cord injuries uh, to that neuromuscular junction. Uh, we can also see muscle dysfunction, CNS disorders, drugs that affect neuromuscular function like we talked about with narcotics, uh, things like that. Uh, so when we're looking at these, the onset of respiratory failure can vary considerably depending on the cause of the neuromuscular dysfunction. If it's drug-induced neuromuscular failure, usually it has a rapid onset. Whereas the onset of respiratory failure in a disease like myasthenia gravis it may not occur for days, years, or it might not even happen at all, right? So it depends on that, that situation there. But regardless of the cause, intubation, mechanical ventilation are indicated if respiratory fatigue occurs. So if they start having that fatigue uh, in a patient with neuromuscular disorder, uh, acute respiratory failure is imminent, uh, then we might need to go ahead and uh, go ahead and intubate those patients. Um, the MIP maximum inspiratory pressure uh, that you'll see here on the screen, right? The maximum inspiratory pressure and vital capacity uh, are two big ones that we're going to use to assess respiratory muscle strength, right? We're looking at how strong are those muscles, especially in patients with neuromuscular disorders. So these measurements are non-invasive, right? There, there's no needles involved with these traditionally. Uh, they're easy, relatively easy to obtain and inexpensive. So you can measure a MIP or some people call it a NIF, a negative inspiratory force. You can measure a maximum inspiratory pressure in a vital capacity, usually every two to four hours. And you're looking uh, for also changes in the respiratory status with these as well. So that's something to pay attention to. Uh, different protocols might have it at different time intervals, but usually every two to four hours is going to be your common interval. Uh, usually a MIP of negative 20 to negative 30 or less, right? Um, uh, centimeters of water pressure. So uh, anything less than 20 centimeters of water means their muscle strength is pretty poor. So if I go into a patient's room with myasthenia gravis and I do a NIF or MIP, right? And they pull in, but they only give me 10 centimeters of water pressure. Well, that means their muscles are very weak. If, I, if they pull in and they give me 40 centimeters of water pressure, that means that muscle is still doing strong, right? So anything less than 20 centimeters of water pressure or a vital capacity lower than 10 to 15 mLs per kilo uh, is also a sign that they have poor diaphragmatic function. So I have them blow into my vital capacity machine, my PFT machine, right? And then sure enough, their, their, their vital capacity is less than 10 mLs per kilo. That's a sign that their diaphragm is not very strong. Their respiratory muscles are not very strong. So uh, the effectiveness of improving outcomes by using these is not established yet. However, uh, when we're looking at uh, trying to see where this patient is with their muscle strength, it does help us gauge muscle strength and trending of their muscle strength. Uh, but the other thing you might have to do with this patient population is get a baseline AVG value, right? So that along with periodic pulse oximetry, as long as it's accurate in those patients, are appropriate when caring for neuromuscular patients uh, because we'll see those signs of hypoventilation, we'll see those signs of hypoxemia, we'll see the sign of pH changes, we'll see those earlier on in those uh, situations than we would see with a, a MIP or a vital capacity. So repeating ABG analysis may be indicated if the patient's clinical condition changes. So let's say they feel more fatigued today, there's less responsiveness, they're starting to uh, not interact as much with the care team, then that might be a sign that we, not, we might need to do an arterial blood gas. Or let's say they can't form adequate seals to do a NIP or a MIP or a VC, right? These are all things that we have to look at together as a care team and make these decisions. So uh, if a patient's condition progressively worsens, then we should not wait uh, until an acute situation develops to intervene. So am I going to wait till their CO2 goes above 50 before we start intervening? Or, or am I going to wait till they, they go really hypoxemic and, and uh, have Cyanosis, acrocyanosis? No, right? So we're not going to wait to intervene. Usually, uh, Invasive positive pressure ventilation in these patients should be initiated before an acute respiratory acidosis develops. So we're going to watch these patients pretty closely. 
And finally, uh, when we're talking about this, uh, things like pleura uh, occupying lesions, like pleural fusions, a hemothorax, empyema, a pneumothorax, right? Those are all things that can also increase that work of breathing, right? And this is that third part, that work of breathing. So anything that's a chest wall deformity, like a flail chest or rib fracture or kyphoscoliosis uh, or uh, obesity, significant, we're talking usually morbid obesity in this area, uh, those are all going to reduce the volumes. So we're going to have that restrictive effect, just like we talked about pleural fusions, hemothorax, empyema, pneumothorax, right? Anything that decreases that thoracic size, flail chest, rib fracture, kyphoscoliosis, obesity, uh, increases air, uh, uh, increases the amount of pressure it takes, right? It reduces lung compliance, lung and thoracic wall compliance, right? It reduces the ability for the lungs to expand, right? And so that's going to make it very hard for that patient to breathe and get good oxygen into the bloodstream and get good CO2 out of their bloodstream. So uh, the other thing that we had to talk about, those are restrictive effects. Well, the next part is obstructive effects. And that's where you see, hey, restrictive disorders. But then also you see, hey, I put some peak flows, right? Peak flow, FEV1, uh, the FEV1%. Increase in airway resistance, like retained secretions, uh, mucosal edema, bronchoconstriction, airway inflammation, foreign body aspiration, <gasps> asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, croup, acute epiglottitis, acute bronchitis, right? All these obstructive conditions can easily make it hard for someone to breathe. Whether it's a restrictive effect or an obstructive effect, they can work hard to breathe. So if someone's working hard to breathe, it doesn't mean they're restrictive, it doesn't mean they're, they're obstructive, right? It, it's non-specific to either one, right? All you know is that they're working hard to breathe, right? So it can be a restrictive that's causing it or obstructive that's causing it. We got to treat those, right? Those are things that we're going to be treating. But in the meantime, do we need to support this patient's breathing? right? Uh, lung tissue involvement. Let's look at lung tissue. If we have someone with pulmonary fibrosis that's developing or is someone that aspirated and they have uh, chemical pneumonitis, uh, uh, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, where their, their lungs are pretty much forming pus and cellular mediators are filling their airways and lots of inflammation is going on and their ability to diffuse gas also decreases pretty significantly in that one. Uh, let's say it's a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right? From a heart failure failure or a drug-induced pulmonary edema, right? All these things that lung tissue involvement is going to reduce not only the ability to diffuse gas into the alveolar capillary membrane through and out of the alveolar capillary membrane, but also what's going to happen to lung compliance, what's going to happen with airway resistance with these conditions, right? Pulmonary vascular problems, right? That's a whole nother thing, right? If I have someone that has a, a pulmonary thromboembolism, a PE, uh, pulmonary vascular damage, right? Uh, if those things, if someone has a PE, what's going to happen to their work of breathing, right? They're going to increase their rate and their depth of breathing, right? That's that compensation mechanism. So that would be a pulmonary vascular problem. Uh, other problems, uh, increased metabolic rate. Well, let's say we have someone with a sepsisemia, right? Let's say they have a massive blood infection. Can that really impact their metabolic rate and their ability to breathe and work harder to breathe? Yeah, because their minute ventilation is going to have to increase to help get rid of that CO2 their body's creating, right? So their metabolic rate's increasing, so that's going to cause pulmonary problems. It's going to cause them to work harder to breathe to get rid of that CO2. Uh, other things that can make it hard to breathe, postoperative pulmonary co complications. Uh, postoperative pulmonary pneumonia or pulmonary infections are going to be one of our primary things that we're trying to work at, especially after general anesthesia uh, there too. Uh, and then even dynamic hyperinflation, which is a fancy word for air trapping. So that's your classic COPD or emphysema type situation where they don't have a long enough time constant to exhale and they inhale again before completely exhaling and they're building up, building up, building up, building up, building up pressure, right? And it makes it harder and harder to take that next breath. So when we're looking at this, there are a lot of conditions that can increase the work of breathing. So when you see an increase of work of breathing, it could be a number of different things, but that work of breathing leads to respiratory fatigue and failure. So tachycardia and tachypnea are non-specific and mostly subjective signs that provide only a limited help in deciding when to intubate or to ventilate a patient. And that's why we look at things like peak flows, obstructive airways, chest x-rays. That's why we look at um, our MIPS, our vital capacities. That's why we look at all these other factors as well.
So physiological measurements. So this leads into our measurements here. And you'll see this beautiful chart. Uh, so obviously, we often use mechanics and ABG results to detect respiratory failure. So unfortunately, uh, valid predictive thresholds for these measurements have not been substantiated. In other words, there are disagreements about some of these thresholds. But, uh, and there's not a lot of evidence surrounding them currently. So it it's uh it's hard uh, a gray area where you'll see it there but in general we've already talked about some hard and fast ones right the absence of guidelines can sometimes make it difficult for us as newer clinicians to know when to intubate or to provide ventilation in distress so this is where you're going to get a sort of a gray area or debate among different clinicians. However, we're going to look at the whole picture. We're going to look at it as a team and look at where this patient is. Is it is the condition they're currently in readily reversible before we do something like invasive ventilation support? If it is, then let's do that, right, before putting someone on a ventilator and pumping their body full of everything, right? So when we're looking at this, this is where we're going to just give you these values and we're going to go with these for now, but understand your mileage may vary out there. So this list is normal adult values for ventilator mechanics and suggest uh, critical ranges that may indicate the need for mechanical ventilation when considered with other assessments, right? We don't just look at uh, a vital capacity and be like, oh, they have their vital capacity is low, let's put them on a ventilator. No, what, what if their effort was poor? What if they weren't feeling very motivated? What if they didn't have a good mouth seal when they did that m measurement? So when we're looking at this, we need to look at those aspects. That's why it's used in in combination with other assessment criteria. So most of these parameters are probably better used as indications for discontinuing ventilation for your liberation phase more than your initiation phase. So with two exceptions, right? Patients with neuromuscular disorders, like their MIP and their vital capacity are usually gonna be the benefit uh, thing that we're gonna be looking at with that specific patient population because we're looking at muscle strength in, uh, in in those two patient situations, right? So vital capacity and MIP are look great at looking for muscle strength. So patients with reactive airways disease like asthma, uh, COPD, the FEV1 might be the best thing to look at for not only intubation, but also for extubation. So if I was able to get an FEV1% or peak flow somehow uh, on those patients, then that's something that could be more valuable than a MIP or a, a vital capacity. Right. So this is where you as the clinician got to understand, OK, what's going on? Is this a neuromuscular patient or is this an obstructive airways patient? Right. Which one's going to be more beneficial in helping me to make this determination or make the care team make this determination? So uh, the FEV1 is more useful for small airway functions than peak expiratory flow. Peak expiratory flow is more general. So if you had to pick one, pick the uh, FEV1 percent. Right. Pick the FEV1 percent. So that's where you're going to see these measurements. Do I expect you to know these? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, when we're starting to talk about a, such a, a subject as this. So more measurements here. Uh, PaCO2, we've been talking about this already quite extensively. So the best single indicator of adequate ventilation is PaCO2. The best single indicator of adequate ventilation is PaCO2. The best indica <laughs> indicator of adequate ventilation is PaCO2. So um, the gold standard for adequate ventilation is get a blood gas and check their PaCO2, right? So I'm hearing you highlight this in your notes. I'm hearing you, you, you burn that into your brain, right? A PaCO2 of greater than 50 to 55 uh, with a decreasing pH less than 725 indicates acute hypoventilation or acute hypercapnic or hypercarbic respiratory failure. I'll repeat that again. A PaCO2 greater than 50 to 55 with a decreasing pH less than 725 indicates acute hypoventilation or acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. So when we're looking at this, a PaCO2 suggests that dead space usually is increased relative to normal tidal volume. In other words, you're not able to get as much CO2 out of your system as you were before with that same tidal volume. So when we're looking at this, this is something called the VDVT ratio, or dead space to tidal volume ratio. So a normal dead space to tidal volume ratio, so VD to VT, 
and a normal ratio is 0.3 to 0.4 at normal tidal volumes, that's a normal VDVT. But if it gets to 0 0.6, so dead space to tidal volume ratio, right, this is where this is going at. Uh, if it gets to 0 0.6, that means there's a critical increase in dead space, right? So dead space, usually you're thinking cardiovascular, right, or pump failure, right? Uh, not pulmonary pump failure, but the cardiac pump failure, right? So you're having a uh, core pulmonale, you're having vascular vasodilation like from a sepsis, right? You're losing vascular tone, so the patient's in shock, right? So this is usually low perfusion, low cardiovascular performance, right? So if it gets to 0.6, there's a in critical increase in the dead space. So if I have um, a patient whose VDVT is increasing, then that's a sign, especially if it gets to 0.6, that this person might need supportive care like mechanical ventilation. So if we had a tidal volume of 500 mLs and a patient had a VDVT of 0.6, for each breath given, only 40% or 200 mLs of that will actually go to pulmonary blood flow. That's it. Just 200 mLs will go into pulmonary blood flow and contribute to gas exchange. Well, obviously, that patient's going to go into failure pretty quickly. 60% uh, uh, or 300 mLs goes to areas that are not in contact, so it stays in your conducting zone. It doesn't get to the respiratory zone to exchange gas. So most of the breath that that person's breathing is just staying in their large airways. Hardly any of it's actually getting to the respiratory zone to exchange and get in contact with the pulmonary capillary bed. Uh, bed. So under these conditions, this patient's gonna breathe faster, right? They're gonna increase their respiratory rate to try to get a gas uh, exchange that's adequate. So this is a sign that they have uh, dead space is increased, right? So there's uh, less uh, less ability to get gas into and out of their their pulmonary capillaries. So usually we're looking at thromboembolisms, like a pulmonary uh, embolism, uh, pulmonary vascular injury, uh, hypoperfusion, like I talked about with shock. Uh, so when we're looking at this, measurement of your VDVT uh, usually means you're going to have to collect exhaled gas. And there are CO2 extensions that we could put in line with mechanical ventilation that can do this. Uh, and then hopefully you'll see some examples of that uh, in your clinical rotations out as well. So a lot of times in the past, it was time consuming uh, for a lot of these patients that were in respiratory failure. But there's a lot less non-invasive methods, such as volumetric capnography, um, that can really help out. So volumetric capnography is a big uh, a way that we can do this, and it's a lot simpler than what it used to be. All right, the next part here is failure to oxygenate. So we just talked about this top one here. Um, failure to ventilate, now we're talking about partial pressure of oxygen. So PaO2 is a good indicator of oxygenation status, right? Assuming normal forms of hemoglobin, right? We don't have carboxyhemoglobin, we don't have methemoglobin, right? Assuming we have normal hemoglobin forms, uh, then a normal PaO2 is 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury, right? So we're assuming sea level here, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and then this varies with age. Even your body position can have impact your P little AO2. Uh, we've seen this a lot with prone patients, right? So we can see a little bit different uh, in PO2s even with body position. So when we're looking at this, 80 to 100 is your normal, right? Uh, when we're looking at monitoring pulse oximetry, it's easy it's non-invasive and it can trend their status. But when we're looking at PO2, PO2 isn't reflected on pulse oximetry traditionally, right? It's usually just the saturation. PO2 is the amount of pressure of oxygen, so how much is in the plasma. Uh, it's not how much is on the hemoglobin, which is your saturation. So when we look at PO2, it's still got to be from an arterial blood gas. So a PO2 less than 70 at sea level, right? A PO2 less than 70 millimeters of mercury or a pulse ox less than 90% on an oxygen mass that's greater than 60% indicates refractory hypoxemic 
uh, refractory hypoxemia or hypoxemic respiratory failure. So when we're looking at their ability to carry oxygen, it's going to be reduced by just uh, if they're on high FiO2s, uh, FiO2 is greater than 60% and their pulse ox is less than 90% or their PO2 is less than 70%, that's a sign of refractory hypoxemia. And that's a sign we might actually have to go up on pressure. Right? That's usually traditionally going up on pressure versus going up on FiO2. What's the definition of insanity? <gasps> Doing the same thing, expecting different results, right? And so we're going to go up on FiO2 if we go up above uh, 60% and we're still getting hardly any change in our P little AO2, then that's a sign we might need to go up on pressure to help with that diffusion across the AC membrane, right? So acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, uh, the other thing that we can look at here is the CaO2, which is this one here, the content of arterial oxygen. So this is an equation. You're like, yes, I don't see people do an equation at the bedside. Well, here's the thing. If you know this, uh, look at the patient's hemoglobin level. Is it normal, right? So here are the factors that go in. The CaO2 equation is hemoglobin times 1.34 times their saturation in a decimal form. Then we're going to add the, that to the P little AO2 times 0 0.003. That's your normal CO2 equation. All right. So you're like, well, I don't, I don't want to count. Yeah, I don't. I'm not going to do that there. Well, I, I'm, I would have a debate with you on that. But uh, when we're looking at that, well, what's the big factor? Is it what's in the plasma? Uh, what's in the uh, hemoglobin, right? Do you have a low hemoglobin level to begin with? Is that patient anemic, right? If the patient's anemic, guess why they're hypoxemic? Because they're anemic, right? Right. That's why they're having such oxygenation issues. Hey, their saturation's poor. Well, is there something wrong with their hemoglobin? Is there dysfunctional hemoglobin like met hemoglobin, so on and so forth? Or is their P little AO2 low, right? If their P little AO2 is low, why is their P little AO2 low? Is it because their P big AO2 is low? Because they have too much CO2 stuck in their lungs because we're not getting adequate tidal volume, right? So that's where arterial oxygen content is actually your most effective method to see how the body's carrying oxygen. This is something they talk about on your board exam. Right. The which of the following is the most effective way to determine oxygenation on your patient? They're going to give you saturation. They're going to give you PaO2. You're going to say no. You're going to answer CaO2 because CaO2 truly is the best way because it combines both what's in the plasma, your PO2, and what's on your hemoglobin molecule, your saturation. It combines those two together to look at your total oxygenation that can be delivered. So that's why CaO2 is the best method for determining total oxygen uh, uh, ability. Uh, so when we're looking at the best way to see if a patient has good oxygenation, CaO2 is going to be the best method. Uh, so your C co capillary content, right? It's a fun equation too. You can give it a try, right? Uh, so we're looking at arterial uh, content of oxygen with that one. So it, like I said, combines the best of, best of both worlds when we're looking at it. So the next one here is your A to A ratio, right? Your A to A ratio. So when we're looking at P little AO2 uh, and we're looking at SPO2, so pulse, pulse oximetry, we're looking at how far we're, or how well we're able to get from the alveoli into the artery. So P big AO2 versus your P little AO2. So we're just looking at how easy it is or how hard it is, if you will, to get oxygen from one area in the lung unit to in the pulmonary capillary. So we can look at pulse oximetry, but does it really give us a quantifiable value for our diffusion? No, but if I look at A to A ratio uh, or A to A gradient, right, then that can easily tell me uh, how well my diffusion is getting worse or if it is getting better, right? So the A to A ratio or PF ratio uh, are the two things that we're going to look at here. So here's the A to A ratio. So this is a key indicator of hypoxemic respiratory failure, right? And it's used to determine alter the cause of the altered oxygenation. So a normal A to A gradient for a patient is around 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury, right? 
So that's the normal range uh, for patient breathing room air. But what if we have a patient breathing 100% oxygen? You're like, Derek, how many times am I evaluating oxygenation on a patient that's breathing room air? Right? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, let me give you the one if a person's on 100% oxygen. The normal P big A minus P little a O2 gradient is 25 to 65 millimeters of mercury. Right, so they're on 100% oxygen. The normal P big A minus P little a, right, uh, is around 25 to 65 millimeters of mercury. So when the PaO2 is low, right, uh, and the P big AO2 is high, the hypoxemia is due to a shunt, a diffusion defect, or a, a VQ mismatch of some sort. So it helps us identify what's causing it. So the PaCO2 in this case might be normal or even low, right? Uh, if a patient is trying to hyperventilate to compensate for hypoxemia. So the A, a to A ratio, besides the A to A gradient, is another approach. And that's what we're talking about now. This ratio is another approach that can look at oxygenation. So A to A gradient is one way to look at oxygenation. The A to A ratio is another way to look at oxygenation. A normal A to A ratio is about 0.75 to 0.95, right? So this means that 75 to 95% of the oxygen available to the alveoli is diffusing. So we have at least 75% of the oxygen is diffusing into the pulmonary capillaries. So that's a good sign, right? So normally you have 75, at least 75% of the oxygen diffusing into the alveoli, right? That's a normal, 75 to 95, or 0.75 to 0.95 when you do this equation. So uh, if I had a PO2 of 90 and I had a PAO2 in room air of 100, this means my ratio is 0.9. That means 90% of it, right? Uh, 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 or a value of 0.15 uh, is critical. So 90% so of it is making it into the capillary. But if I do this uh, and I only have 0.15, right? So I have a very, very low P uh, A to A ratio. Then let's say I have a value of 0.15, right? Uh, that means only 15% of the oxygen is getting into the artery, into that capillary, right, from the alveoli. So the higher the ratio, the better. The lower the ratio, the worse, right? Uh, so if I have, like I said, a patient where it's 0.5, right, that means only 50% of the oxygen is getting into the capillary. If I have a patient that's 20.25 or 25%, only 25% of that gas is getting into the, the capillary. So that's where you want a high value, usually 75 to 95% or 0.75 to 0.95. So uh, that's one of the things that you got to watch on this one is the P, uh, PF ratio or P, uh, a, P, uh, the A to A ratio. The next one is the PF ratio, which is the last one here that I got caught up there for a second. The PF ratio uh, is something that you're going to see quite a bit, and it's in literature quite a bit out there. It eliminates the need to calculate alveolar oxygen, so you don't have to use the alveolar air equation, which why wouldn't you want to? But that's a whole separate uh, subject. But uh, you eliminate the need to do the alveolar air equation, and I think that's why a lot of people like it, but don't take my word for it. Uh, so this one, we're looking at the A to A, A, PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So instead of the P big AO2, we have an alveoli, and we just look at uh, FiO2. How much FiO2 there is compared to the P little AO2. So we're looking at diffusion once again. We're looking at the ability to oxygenate. So this one, uh, normal values are pretty straightforward on this one. If I have someone on 100% oxygen, so 1.0 FiO2, right? So 1.0, and their P little AO2 is 40, right? That makes the math easy. What's 40 over 1? 40, right? So this means that their ability to diffuse oxygen is extremely impaired, right? They have refractory hypoxemia. If their PF ratio is 40, uh, they have refractory hypoxemia. Normal should be oh, well over 300, right? Normal should be well over 300. So when we're looking at PF ratio, the lower the score, the worse it is. Sounds a lot like the A to A ratio, right? So the PF ratio and the A to A ratio, both of those, the lower the score, the worse it is to get oxygen into the bloodstream. The higher the score, the easier it is to get oxygen into the bloodstream. 
So do I expect you to know those ratios, right? PAF ratio, PA to A ratio, uh, the CO2 equation, do I expect you to know that one? Yes, I expect you to know those, right? Uh, and then when we're looking at these, I want you to understand, okay, we're looking at diffusion, we're looking at oxygenation here. All right, so what are some specific treatments uh, to help uh, support arterial hypoxemia. So when we're looking at this, we need to support uh, the pulmonary system so it can maintain an adequate level of alveolar ventilation. So if we start to see respiratory fatigue before it goes into respiratory failure, let's support it. Maybe we do non-invasive, maybe we do invasive, right? Depends on the situation of the patient. But if it's due to hyper uh, hypoventilation, well, we need to support it. And that's where positive pressure ventilation or where um, uh, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, can kick in. Uh, reduce the work of breathing, that's where assisted ventilation can kick in, right? Uh, where if we're looking at the cause of the, the, I, the respiratory fatigue being treated, uh, that's one of the things that we're gonna have to look at. So we're, if we're reducing the fatigue, right, whether it's uh, from pulmonary, whether it's from infection, whether it's from something else, we can support it until it's treated. So specific treatments overall, when we're looking at these, uh, if we're hypoventilating, uh, if we're hypoventilating, then we want to increase alveolar ventilation. Uh, so that's going to be assisted ventilation, and we talked about that as well. But in the meantime, too, I might also need to increase FiO2. I not, might need to increase FiO2 as well because what happens with the ability to get oxygen on the hemoglobin molecule if there's a bunch of parking spaces taken up by CO2, right? We haven't eliminated the CO2 well enough. Well, it probably is deoxygenating it as well. So in the meantime, until I get rid of that CO2, I probably should get it, give FiO2. Right, but in real life, if someone's not breathing and their sats are low, you breathe for them first, right? And it doesn't mean you can't hook it up to 100% oxygen, but it means that you breathe for them first because what I can give you 100% oxygen on a mask, an oxygen mask, but what's going to be your ability to get rid of CO2 from the hemoglobin? It's going to be decreased. So your ability to get C uh, oxygen to stick into your blood is going to be very hard, right? So that's where we're going to breathe for these patients. Uh, if we have a low ventilation to perfusion ratio, we're going to give them more FiO2, but this is also where we might consider positive pressure or CPAP, right? Continuous positive airway pressure is going to be very helpful if we have a low VQ ratio because we're going to have more surface area. We're going to have more pressure to help diffuse gas. If we have a pulmonary shunt, uh, that's where we would still increase FiO2, but CPAP is going to be one of your better treatments because usually these patients are refractory to FiO2. So can you still give them FiO2? Of course you can. However, uh, usually they're refractory and that's why they need pressure, right? That's why they usually need pressure. Uh, if there's a diffusion uh, a defect, uh, like let's say it's a pneumonia. Pneumonia is one of your classic diffusion defects, right? You have the increased thickness of the AC membrane, the loose space of the respiratory zone, that lymph tissue is all swollen, it pushes the capillary away, right? We're going to have cellular debris that can uh, flood into the respiratory zone as well. So if we have something like that going on, uh, we can give FiO2, of course. Uh, however, steroids might be indicated in this case if it's an inflammatory uh, situation, um, or what if it's just fluid like pulmonary edema or cardiogenic pulmonary edema, whether it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. We might need to give diuretics uh, depending on the patient's situation as well to help with that diffusion defect if it's that pulmonary edema component. Uh, low barometric pressure, right? Uh, descend to lower altitude. These are your classic high altitude pulmonary edema patients. So let's treat the cause. Uh, they're high altitude and they're they're having pulmonary edema from that. Let's send them back down to sea level or back down to town where it's a little bit lower if I, uh, lower uh, uh, than we have the higher barometric pressure in town compared to where they're currently at the lower barometric pressure. And finally, low inspired oxygen concentration, of course, we're going to increase increase their FiO2. For some reason, they're breathing at FiO2 0.17, right? <laughs> Somehow. Uh, let's give them normal. Give them normal FiO2. So we'll move on from there. All right. So what are some standard criteria for instituting mechanical ventilation? So apnea or absence of breathing, if they're not breathing at all, 
right? Uh, if they're in an acute ventilatory failure, if they're in an impending ventilatory failure. In other words, their blood gas is normal, but they're sweating and they're diaphoretic and they're tripoding, right? That's a sign that they're in an impending diaphragmatic failure, right? They're impending respiratory failure. So refractory hypoxemia is going to be another thing that we're going to see with increased work of breathing, ineffective breathing patterns like biots, Shane Stokes, all those are going to be pretty significant. Um, so we need to protect the patient's airway with uh, situations like stroke, uh, drug overdose, cerebral damage, copious secretions. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, you're looking at a patient overall. Uh, do we need to support the pulmonary system so it can maintain adequate oxygen alveolar ventilation? We need to reduce their work of breathing. We need to restore their acid-base balance. We need to increase oxygen delivery. We need to prevent complications that are associated with mechanical ventilation, like too much pressure, too much volume, or too little pressure, too little volume. Uh, too fast of a breath, too slow of a breath, right? Uh, right uh, time constant for these patients. So we're going to have to factor all these in together. So when we're looking at indications for mechanical ventilations with adult acute respiratory failure uh, is going to be uh, something that we could see with apnea or impending respiratory rest or an acute exacerbation of COPD. Uh, with dyspnea, tachypnea, respiratory acidosis, uh, uh, their pH uh, especially can be one of our primary factors that we're looking at here because their CO2s might be high at baseline. We can also see cardiovascular instability, right? If someone has very poor hemodynamics, that is an indication for mechanical ventilation. So we're going to take the workload of the heart because we're going to be able to deliver a lot more oxygen to the heart more effectively if we're using positive pressure ventilation, as well as we might be able to reduce the workload of the heart uh, depending on what we do with the vena cave and the thoracic pressure. Uh, altered mental status, if a patient is unable to protect their airway, uh, they're, um, uh, they're not, they don't have a cough or a gag reflex. Uh, those are all things, so inability to protect the lower airway. If they have copious vis viscous secretions, so in other words, secretions that they're working hard to breathe past, that can be another sign that we might have to do invasive mechanical ventilation, possibly add uh, therapeutic procedures to that one as well. Any abnormalities of the face or upper airway that prevent uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, let's say their jaw is, they were in a severe trauma and their jaw has been compromised, things like that, uh, where they can't do invasive ventilation unless we have the BiPAP helmet, right, the invasive helmet, anything like that. Uh, that could be a situation where we go with invasive versus non-invasive ventilation, broken face, broken uh, bones, things like that. Uh, anything that causes acute ventilatory insufficiency, like neuromuscular disease, is an indication. Uh, acute respiratory acidosis, we talked about that. Uh, vital capacity, less than 10 to 15 mLs per kilo. Uh, progressive decline in their MIP, uh, 20 to 30, so less than 20, is uh, usually one of your signs. Acute hypoxemic failure with tachypnea and persistent hypoxemia despite high FiO2. So you're giving them lots of FiO2 and their PO2 is still less than 70 uh, millimeters of mercury. That's a sign we might have to go ahead and use invasive. Uh, when they're on high flow oxygen, I should say. Acute cardiovascular instability, we talked about that. Altered mental status, protection of the airway. These are all things that are important to look at too. Um, when we're looking at these, other things that we have to look at is uh, when we're looking at intubating, we have to look at the right size of tube for that patient. If we have a really small tube, then we're actually going to be causing an increased work of breathing when we're trying to get this patient off, right? Um, or do they need a minute ventilation over 10 liters per minute? Let's say they have a sepsis. Let's say they have a high metabolic rate uh, situation going on. We might have to use a higher metabolic rate, right? So if I have a tube of seven, uh, seven millimeters uh, internal diameter, or less, then that means I can only do at most 10 liters per minute or less, right? So if I have an ET tube uh, greater than or equal to eight, then I can do a minute ventilation uh, up to 15 liters per minute. So we're looking at also a limitation of the size of the tube, depending on how much minute ventilation we're gonna give. So we need to take that into factor as well. Um, so, 
when we're looking at this, if I've tried therapies and they still have dyspnea, they're still in acute respiratory distress, they still have an exacerbation of the chronic disease, they're still in an acute asthmatic exacerbation, despite all these interventions, the hypoxemia is, is an isolated finding, if they have a traumatic brain injury, if they have flail chest, uh, these are all things that we need to take into factor if they're not getting better. Uh, with uh, non-invasive therapies, then we might have to go with invasive therapies like mechanical ventilation. Uh, big goals here is to restore arterial acid-base balances, right? We talked about that before. I want to restore their acid-base balances, which is what we see here, right? I want to get those back. I want to increase oxygen delivery to the body organs and tissues. And we got to watch out here. This can also be compromised if we give too much thoracic pressure. If I give too much thoracic pressure and I reduce venous return to the, the heart, then the heart's not pumping as much blood through the lungs to pick up oxygen to then send it to the left ventricle. If the left ventricle is not getting enough blood, what happens to your stroke line? What happens to your cardiac output? It decreases. What happens to your delivery of oxygen to your tissues? Your delivery of oxygen to your tissues decreases. So we have to watch out with thoracic pressures when we're looking at getting oxygen to the body's organs and tissues as well. That can be something that factors in. So uh, preventing complications like having uh, lower blood pressure with uh, mechanical ventilation should be something that we're paying attention to. If we go on to go to the ventilator and we increase the amount of pressure that we're giving a patient somehow, whether we increase the PEEP or we increase something else, and we see that their, their blood pressure became more, more narrow, their pulse pressure decreased, difference between a systolic and diastolic decreased, and we see the heart rate started to go up, that's a sign we impacted blood flow, we, we decreased their stroke volume, we increased their heart, their heart rate increased naturally. It's a sign that we actually might have caused a squishing of the vena cable, we might have caused a restriction of blood flow, and that might be a negative thing. We caused more of a dead space effect, so we might actually have to go back down on our mean airway pressure or, uh, or whatever thing that we're using there. So we got to pay attention to these signs and complications that are associated with mechanical ventilation as well. All right, some concept checks for you. So these are great to make sure that you have some of this good information down. Uh, so the ability to recognize that a patient uh, requires an artificial airway in mechanical ventilation is an essential skill for uh, practitioners. So knowing when a patient needs an airway and when they don't are very, very important, right? We don't wanna just go be putting tubes in every person that comes in, right? Uh, and we don't wanna delay care for patients either because that could lead to a lot more serious complications as well. So recognizing that a patient requires an artificial airway and mechanical ventilations are, is an essential skill for practitioners. And then decisions made in acute care settings must be based on evidence-based criteria. Yeah, what's in what, what gets filled in here? Evidence-based criteria, right? Evidence-based criteria clearly demonstrates that whatever you're doing, that procedure or technique is beneficial and with good outcomes like improved quality of life, reduced length of stay, and a lower mortality rate, right? So we need to make sure that we're using evidence-based guidelines. And one of the things we'll talk about in this course is ARDS net ventilation and lung protective ventilation. It's going to be a big thing. Uh, ARF is defined as the inability to maintain adequate oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide clearance. Yep, that's the official definition. Adequate oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide clearance. There are two types of ARF, acute respiratory failure. They are hypoxemic respiratory failure and hypercapnic failure, hypoxemic and hypercapnic. Hypoxemic respiratory failure can be treated with oxygen, uh, oxygen or you can use it in a combination with FiO2, right, oxygen, or in combination with PEEP or CPAP, something that increases pressure, especially for those refractory hypoxemic patients. Uh, acute hypo hypercapnic respiratory failure, that's what goes in that space there. Acute hypercapnic respiratory failure occurs when a patient cannot maintain adequate ventilation to maintain their CO2, right? That means they're 
They're tiring out. They're fatiguing, right? The primary physiological objectives of mechanical ventilation should include supporting or improving pulmonary gas exchange, right? Supporting or improving gas exchange, right? If I put you on a breathing machine and your gas exchange doesn't improve, I'm not doing my job, right? It doesn't stay the same or improve. I'm not doing my job, right? So it should um, support or improve gas exchange. Uh, increasing lung volume in certain situations, right? Especially if they have a severe atelectasis, right? Collapse of the lung tissue and or reducing work of breathing. Right, reducing work of breathing. So the primary physiological objectives, mechanical ventilation should include supporting or improving pulmonary gas exchange, increasing lung volume, and reducing work of breathing. Uh, simple and direct observations really can give you a lot of valuable information about the cause of distress and serve as a guide for selecting appropriate act activity. So if it's hypoxemic respiratory failure, then I can focus on the FiO2 CPAP pressure side if it's hypercarbic then it could focus on assisted ventilation side of it right so it can give us that sort of simple effect there and as well as how severe is the hypoxemic failure is it just a headache or is it the point where they're not responsive right so it can determine how aggressive we're going to be with that so recognizing clinical signs of hypoxemia and hypercapnia is the first step to the successful treatment of a patient that's in respiratory distress. So when we're looking at this, uh, do we treat them aggressively with invasive ventilation or do we treat them more with non-invasive methods, right? And then the onset of respiratory failure can considerably vary considerably depending on the cause of the neuromuscular dysfunction. If it's myasthenia gravis, it can be days, weeks, or never, right? Uh, years, uh, right? Or we could have a situation where it happens almost right away, like with the spinal cord injury. So the onset of respiratory failure can vary depending on the cause of the neuromuscular dysfunction. And then finally, especially with patients that have um, neuromuscular issues, the MIP maximum inspiratory pressure and or vital capacity can be used to assess respiratory muscle strength. Um, so the, the other thing here is we can also get baseline AVGs or periodic pulse ox measurements that can help manage these patients as well. But the MIP and the VC are really going to tell us about the strength of those muscles. So normally when we're looking at worker breathing, we're looking at how much workload it really takes for your oxygen consumption. We see the oxygen consumption increase and at baseline, it's about one to 4%. So one to 4% of your total oxygen consumption at rest is just for work of breathing. But what happens when we have a patient that's really tachypnic? What happens when we have a patient that is breathing deep and rapid, or let, let's say shallow and rapid? What happens with that work of breathing? It's going to increase. What happens when we see these patients that are trying to overcome pleural pressures, that are trying to overcome airway resistance issues? They're gonna work harder to breathe, and that's where we're gonna see an increase in oxygen requirements for these patients as well. Next, we're going to see different criteria, so vital capacity, peak expiratory flow, uh, respiratory rate, um, uh, V volumetric CO2, dead space to tidal volume ratio, really can give us valuable information about a patient's status and help us uh, learn what's going on with their respiratory dysfunction. So that VDVT ratio is going to be part of that. Uh, so that's going to help us determine, okay, how severe is it? Is 95% of the uh, gas being exchanged or is it 5% of the gas being exchanged, right? And the standard criteria for initiating mechanical ventilation includes apnea, impending or confirmed ARF, acute respiratory failure, and refractory hypoxemia, right? And refractory hypoxemia characterized by an increased worker breathing or ineffective breathing pattern. So when we're looking at these, we have the invasive method, but the next one that we'll talk about here is non-invasive, uh, can be a viable alternative to invasive mechanical ventilation in select patients. Obviously in patients that can't maintain their own airway, they can't protect their airway, the non-invasive may not be helpful. A patient that has broken facial features or um, compromised skin, things like that, we might not be able to appropriately burns, right? We might not be able to appropriately 
get that patient set up to where they can have effective non-invasive ventilation. So those are all situations you're going to have to determine as a team at that bedside as well.